Kevin was in a very, very successful banking career in Los Angeles. He was on the up, he was moving places. And then he had an amazing conversion. Kevin was one of eight young people that started Youth for Life in California. Some of them dwindled out. It ended up with Kevin and a couple of his friends. Youth for Life is now an international youth organization in the Catholic Church. It is spread all over the world. The Pope has given it a papal blessing. Kevin came here last year. I don't know what happened, but things clicked. He was a, an immediate success with all the, the young groups that we uh, took him to. He, we had the youth night last year at St. Peter's College here in Auckland, but there were other groups right throughout New Zealand. As we toured down to Wellington and Christchurch, Kevin was a hit with the young people. I know that he'll be embarrassed about what I'm about to say to him, but I'd like to call on Kevin Cunningham, my friend. Give him a warm welcome. He's too charitable. How are you guys holding up out there? Okay. You should be relieved you're sitting out there. Mark was still telling, torturing us with corny jo jokes backstage. Do you want the latest one? I'm embarrassed to say it, but I'm going to repeat it. What does Winnie the Pooh, John the Baptist, and Attila the Hun have in common? The same middle name, the. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Let's start with a prayer in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, come with those gifts we need to do that which you want. Open our eyes that we may see. Open our ears that we may hear you and open our hearts that we may know you. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Pope John Paul II has said over and over again in his pontificate to the youth, you are the future, you are our hope. And seeing so many of you gathered here tonight, I understand why. It is clear to see why you are this is corny too. The hope of the Pope. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's getting late in the evening. <laughs> I wish to begin my talk by setting the stage of our time, the time that we live in history. And I'm afraid it's not a pretty place. Oftentimes, it's very grim. It is a time where life itself struggles to survive. A time the Pope has described that there exists a great conspiracy against life. I'm often cautioned when I talk to the youth on what I say. You can't say that to them. But I'm not going to water it down for you. I think you need to hear the truth so that you can respond to the challenge that lies before us. But I do want to start with the way the Pope started his pontificate, and that was the words, be not afraid. We are in the midst of a war. It is the greatest battle ever raged, waged, the most horrific holocaust in the history of mankind. And it's not being fought in some foreign land or on some distant shore but is being fought in every pocket of the world, here in your beautiful country of New Zealand, in your local communities. The death toll is frightening. In my country, America, this battle claims one and a half million lives each year. Here in New Zealand, it's approximately 13,000. And the battle, as we know, is abortion. Globally, the numbers are much more staggering. For anyone who didn't hear me last year, does anyone want to take a guess on how many abortions each year worldwide? Throw out some numbers. You were here last year. The UN 
estimates, and this is the UN, that there are 45 million surgical abortions performed each year. What that means is that 45 million babies are going to die this year. 45 million died last year. 45 million will die next year. We're wiping out an entire generation of you and of me. And the examples of what is happening today are just as horrific. There's a late-term abortion procedure. It's known as partial birth abortion, wherein the baby is delivered upside down, feet first, to the base of his or her skull. The doctor uses a blunt instrument such as scissors to puncture. The brain is dissected, and then the baby is fully delivered. Inches, inches from life, from being guaranteed the right to life. That's infanticide. We have, being technologically advanced, started harvesting fetal tissue for research. And we're discovering great new lipsticks with the unborn child. RU486, the abortion pill. We've reduced abortion to flu status. All you need to do is have a prescription go to a pharmacy. And then as Inga had mentioned, in China, where they are consuming the baby, the unborn fetus, as a delicacy. She did not tell you, you can pick one up for $1.25. What little value we place on life. In this time, life has become but a mere commodity, like an old pair of sneakers to be bought and sold. A buck twenty-five. Abortion doesn't stop there. It can't stop. This death mentality keeps reaching out. And we see that. We see that with our elderly in euthanasia. My country, among the young people, there are a lot of senseless, random acts of violence, uh, gang violence. And here in New Zealand, I've just been watching the news of a, a young 16-year-old, and I might pronounce this wrong, in Tokoroa, who abandoned her week-old child in a stream. They're still searching for the body. The madness, this madness, has to stop. And we must give life its proper place in the pecking order. That's top billing. Without life, there are no other issues. Death should not, and it cannot, become an acceptable solution to our perceived problems. We may all be asking ourselves, how have we gotten to this point? More importantly, we should be asking, how do we get out of this crisis? Now, I know I've started out with some grim details. Don't become discouraged. I had a good friend of mine a couple of years ago. He was 17 years old. And he said, I've, I've become so discouraged with the time I live in. I want to lock myself in a room. There's so much death, so much hatred, so much violence. I just want to lock myself in a room. But I got to thinking about a soldier in peacetime. He has nothing to do. And what a great time we live in because there is so much to do. That was words way beyond his years. We see abortion being fought on many levels, uh, politics, legislation, confrontation. It doesn't buy there. The sin, the evil of abortion, lies in our heart. And what we need most today is conversion of hearts. And what our Lord desires most is the conversion of our hearts, of each one of us in this room. We need Christ. He has promised, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. We need to reflect on the theme of this conference, 
Master, where do you live? And respond to his invitation. Come and see. Come and follow me. Look to your Catholic faith and live it faithfully. It was given to, to us by Christ himself, and he is here in the church. And we have so many treasures that no other churches have. We have the sacraments, the Holy Eucharist, the bread of life, where Jesus is truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity. I would no longer be in the pro-life movement except for our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. We have confession, the assurance that our sins are forgiven. Make frequent use of this sacrament. Our Lord on the cross gave to us his mother when he said uh, to John, his beloved son, son, behold your mother, and mother, behold your son. And she takes this role with great urgency. She has never failed. Entrust yourselves to her care. I had the great honor and privilege in 1994 to meet with Pope John Paul II on two occasions. The first time I was introduced by a bishop as the leader of youth, and the Holy Father looked at me looked down and very sternly said, Lita? I have a really bad accent in Turpentine or whatever. But um, I responded, no, no. Our Lady is leader. And he looked up with a great smile. He goes, you are right. Entrust yourselves to our care. And then here, Catholic faith, we have the Pope, the fearless voice of truth in our day. He came to Denver for World Youth Day 93 with a very urgent message to us, the youth. And he said, woe to me if I do not evangelize. Woe to you if you do not succeed in defending life. What a tall order from the vicar of Christ himself to us, the young people. I solemnly assure you that abortion is a youth crisis because it focuses on us two ways. One, the intended victim is the young unborn child, which is ripped from the womb and denied the right to life. But two, the targeted victim, we the youth who are besieged by our media, by our friends, by the government, and yes, by our parents sometimes, to submit to this heinous crime. We predominantly are the ones that are having the abortion. Perhaps some of you have been affected by abortion either personally or someone you know. Do not be afraid to approach Christ. Do not be afraid to seek his love and his healing and his forgiveness because there is something called post-abortion syndrome. So if anyone we know, we need to be there for them to help them through it because it's a very traumatic experience, whether it comes months or years later. Everyone assumes I have always been pro-life. Not true. Simply not true. I remember back in university, my best friend was fooling around. He got his girlfriend pregnant. And I was the one who suggested an abortion. Thankfully, she had her child but regrettably, I had advocated the death sentence. I went to the University of Santa Barbara 
has a well-deserved, or did anyway, a well-deserved reputation of being a party school, and I excelled at that. <laughs> most, most of us return home with a degree from university and uh, awards of merit. Let's see, I returned with the prestigious distinction of being voted the best party house and the most improved partier. <laughs> Quite a good claim. I have committed every sin you can think of, every one. I fell far away from my faith. I went into banking and into investments, and I did really well. At the company I worked for, I was the youngest one to be licensed to sell stock and bond accounts. In California, you need to go through a series of tests. I was also the one who scored highest on those tests, above my president and vice president of the company. I was in the fast lane to success, uh, of success. I had everything that society said I needed to be happy. Money, prestige, a good career, success, friends, power. But I found that I was very, very empty because I didn't have Christ. Your key to happiness is finding God and his will for your life. Thankfully, our Lord and his mother found me where I was at. I have no great claims to fame, no credentials, not even the degree from university. There's been no great works that I've done, nor, uh, nor things I've done, except for one. And that was by the grace of God, as I gave my wholehearted yes, and he has worked miracles through it. Youth for Life started very humbly five years ago with eight young people. Eight young people. And it has since grown across the world with a twofold mission. One, youth evangelizing youth on the faith and the sanctity of life. And two, our personal witness to life. What we do is we go out to the abortion mills in prayer with an image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. As Inga had mentioned, I'm just going to recap a little bit. The reason why Our Lady of Guadalupe, the great miracle in 1531, had three effects. One, that land was ripe for war between the Spaniards and the Aztecs. A great era of peace was granted to the land. Two, resulted in the single largest conversion in the history of the church. In 10 years, over 10 million Indians were baptized into the Catholic faith. And three, it ended the prevalent ritual of human sacrifice. And that's what we need today. Peace, conversion, the end of human sacrifice. Youth for Life almost did not start because of those sins I had mentioned. Satan kept coming back at me about my past. And I kept thinking, how can I make a difference? What can I do? Look what I've done. I'm not worthy. Forgive yourselves. You're right. You're not worthy. It's a trap. Get over it. There's much to be done. We realized that this vision was much more than a local youth group. And that was nuts. I mean, how are we going to do anything? And so I went to my spiritual director and I go, Eight of us, we got this great idea. What are, you know, it, there's no way we can do it. And he said, no, 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 no. It doesn't matter the numbers. It only takes one. One young person to stand up in truth and others will follow how right he was. Our Lord calls each of you to him to his service, to become his hands and feet, to be his courageous apostles for life, to 
to become the fifth gospel. Not a written book, but a living gospel of life. Do not be afraid or overwhelmed, because I know it's a tremendous task. And so I always look back at the words that God gave to Jeremiah when Jeremiah kept complaining, I'm too young. God said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I dedicated you. A prophet to the nations, I appointed you. Say not, I am too young. To whomever I send you, you shall go. Whatever I command you, you shall speak. Have no fear before them, because I am with you to deliver you. See, I place my words in your mouth. This day I set you over nations and over kingdoms to root up and tear down, to destroy and to demolish, to build and to plant. And that's the time we live in a time to root up and tear down, to destroy and to demolish, so that we can rebuild and plant. What can we do? I'm often asked this question, how will abortion end? It's gonna take four things, four things. One, prayer. We must be rooted in prayer. This is not a human war. It's a supernatural battle, and we must use our spiritual weapons. Pray the rosary with fidelity. Make a commitment today, each one of you, to form or to join an existing youth prayer group. In our country, many of our, I'm sad to say, Many of our parish youth groups are falling apart. No one's coming becomes, because they have become mere social clubs. I guarantee you the secular world can do a better job with a social club any day of the week and twice on Sunday over the church. That is not our role. For a youth group to be vital, it needs three, th three things. You need to come together in prayer. Bring in music, make that a part of it. Many of you have the get, great gifts. Use them and share them with your peers. You need that prayer. You need fellowship. Yes, we need to meet together socially. Um, it's too hard to live the faith as young people on our own. We need that camaraderie, the fellowship between each other. I know after going out to the abortion clinics, we'd oftentimes meet for pizza and beers, I mean sodas, and don't go home saying that I said it was all right to drink. But we had a great time together. You need, the third thing is a mission, a mission, a purpose, and that one's a no-brainer in these times. Your mission should be for life. Prayer, the first thing to end abortion. Second thing, work, work. The Holy Father has already given us the prescription Woe to me if I don't evangelize, evangelize. Woe to you if you do not succeed in defending life, defend life. To evangelize, you're going to need to educate yourselves on the faith and on the issues of life so that you can share it with your friends, with your families, and then grow with your local communities, youth groups, schools, uh, religious education programs, wherever you're invited. The key for the youth is that we, as their peers, young people evangelizing young people. Go forth to wherever the Holy Spirit leads you and be open to his prompting. We were recently, a couple of weeks ago in Texas, invited to speak at a juvenile detention center uh, youth prison, and that was very frightening for me. I didn't want to go in there. Um, I thought it was going to be a very small group, and it turned out it was about 80 to 100 kids, young people that were there. After the talk, they all listened, which amazed me, um, for one. Uh, Misty Cruzan was with, with us, and I know they were, were paying attention to her. She's very beautiful, so uh, <laughs> she had their captive attention. <coughs> 
But afterwards, it was startling for me. They were invited um, by the lady who put it on to come up for a special blessing with holy oil. <laughs> yeah, right, they're going to come up for this. And all of them started walking up for a special blessing. Then um, the lady invited them to come back up if they wished to have special prayers said over them or a time of personal prayer. And I'm very uncomfortable. That's not really my thing in that praying over people. And so I started to walk off, off thinking no one's going to come. And as soon as I started to get away, everyone again came forward. And so I felt guilty and went back. The Holy Spirit can work in tremendous ways. Be open to it. Then go on, organize retreats, uh, youth days, P perhaps not as grand as this, but small retreats and invite your friends to come in. That's your evangelization, some ideas. Uh, succeed in defending life. Give witness to life. And the best way to do that is to go out to the abortion mills and prayer. This is the modern day Calvary where the innocent, unborn are crucified, where Jesus is crucified over and over through his innocent, unborn. These children, while here on earth, never experience love, not even the innate, natural love of a mother. Let us be there to give them some sort of love. Here in Auckland, there are many opportunities to get involved, to get involved. Next Generation has a table at the back. I invite you to visit it. It is a group, a pro-life youth group. Um, they go out every Sunday morning to the abortion mill. Um, I encourage you to join us tomorrow morning at 7.30 a.m. <laughs> Someone's going to have to give me a wake-up call back there. <laughs> They'll have more information on that. In July, we're fortunate enough here in Auckland to have a special uh, convention being put on. Um, Sarah Smith, a friend of mine uh, from the United States, will be one of the speakers. I'll be returning for this conference. She has a remarkable testimony. I've heard many, many speakers on life. She is the most powerful. She's an abortion survivor. Her twin was killed in the abortion. They didn't know she was in there. She survived. You, you should come and hear her talk. Um, we also have the Our Lady of Guadalupe Center that is being established by Inga and Jeff. And I know they could use your youthful enthusiasm, so consider volunteering with them. Prayer, work. The third thing, suffering. As the innocent, unborn children suffer, so too must we suffer. I feel like I've been, become an expert on this in the last two months. Let's see what has happened. I've been criticized, chastised, judged, betrayed, abandoned, robbed, evicted, and slandered, and all this by those closest to me. It hurts more that way. Never give up. Offer it up. Never give up. Keep going forward. Then comes the inevitable pro-life question, well, have, uh, have you ever been arrested? <laughs> yeah, I have. <laughs> Not as glamorous as trespassing or, or blocking a clinic or anything. My crime was carrying a full-size image of Our Lady of Guadalupe outside an abortion mill in California. Apparently, she violated a sign injunction that you couldn't carry a sign bigger than four feet by four feet. <laughs> so the police came up, and I'm a kind of a rebellious in nature. I, oh, no, no, no. This isn't a sign. <laughs> this is a framed picture of the Blessed Mother. They're going, well, doesn't make a difference to us. I'm going, but it should. I have constitutional rights. Freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. 
I have a right to carry this picture. We don't agree with you. And so like with all hardened criminals, they handcuffed me and my friend and threw us back in the squad car for about an hour. Mark, at that time, looked over at me. He goes, do you want to pray the rosary? I go, yeah, yeah, I guess. He goes, what mysteries do you want to say? I go, well, I think the sorrowful would be most appropriate. <laughs> the squad car was rocking back and forth. Finally, they at least took us down to book us. Uh, it took the whole squad car back, rocking back and forth. Um, we went in for the booking. I'm not a great criminal. I, I really am not. I was trying to be helpful. They took my picture. They were getting ready to fingerprint me. And the police officer left. So I thought, okay, okay. Ink pad, my hands. I can start, start them off here. So I went ahead, put my hands, dabbed it in the ink, right? Just waiting, waiting. He comes back. Within a minute, boom. The police officer, the camera, me. We were all covered in ink. I don't know what happened. Revenge is sweet. <laughs> Stand up for your faith. God will fight your battles. I was vin vindicated from any crime after three court sessions. Stand up for your faith. Prayer, work, suffering, and the fourth element, every one of you, each one of you, and that is how abortion will end. You are the future. You are our hope. But not just the future. You are the present, and your time is now. It does not end here at this conference. Your mission is just beginning. I pray that you will respond. Because I must ask, how will history judge us? History is a very harsh judge. Will, how will we be remembered? Will we be remembered? Will, <laughs> will we be remembered? <laughs> as, the, <laughs> as the barbaric generation that continued this culture of death, or will we be remembered as the ones that once and for all loudly proclaim the sanctity of life? That choice is ours. I'd just like to end with a prayer and just repeat after me. Lord, teach us to be generous. To serve you as you deserve to be served. To give without counting the cost. To fight without fear of being wounded. To work without seeking rest. And to spend ourselves without expecting any reward. but the knowledge that we are doing your holy will. Amen. 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 God bless you all.